everybody, thank you for joining us and welcome to another episode of Everyday Strong with Dr. Michael G. Daniels. This is your host, C.B. Baker. We have a another great show for you today. And um, last week we talked about the church versus the club. And I know we, we got a whole lot of um, comments on that. And this week we're going to um, dive into more current events and what's going on. And it's happened again. Um, and, and we've talked about this before, Dr. Daniels, with the 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 shooting mm-hmm. of African American men. That's unjust. You know, no reason to, for it to happen, and it's happened again. With young man jogging and basically just accosted and harassed and shot mm-hmm. right in, in the middle of the street. It's it's not. It's it's crazy. You know. Um, but I, I'm gonna take that statement back down to that. I don't, I can't say it's like super crazy because it's been going on. It's right. just now with social media and, and more mass media, we're starting to see it more and recognize it more on a national scale. Right. So welcome to the show, Dr. Daniels. And, and tell me what, what, what's going on? You know, is it is, um, I, I think the problem is top down rhetoric. I mean, that's really what I think. You know, it, it, uh, and, and you're right. We've always had these instances. We've always had when, uh, unfortunately, when, um, you know, people have um, kill, killing, killing uh, blacks have always been in season. You know, uh, it's, it's almost as if um, uh, it's kind of like deer season. You know, it's like black season. It's OK. To, <laughs> it's OK to shoot a black guy, you know. Right. Uh, but I think what, it, what has exacerbated it is the uh, current administration, you know. Uh, e- even though um, the loca- local people have asked the Justice Department to get involved, um, I-, I kind of doubt that the Justice Department on the on the Trump will really do anything because Trump has already said he's already kind of given them out, you know, because he's already said, well, we don't know what happened before they saw them on the tape. So we don't know if he did attack them first. Now, you know, let's be real. Right. Uh, what sense would it make for a, a, a man who's jogging, who's had shorts on and a shirt to attack someone who has a shotgun and someone who has a pistol in their hand? Right. You know, that just doesn't even make sense. So for them to say that he attacked them first is just the most insane thing I've ever heard. It just sickens me that the white district attorneys in that county would actually use it as a reason for not prosecuting. Because these guys were free for two months and would not have got, would not have been arrested if someone had not leaked the tape. Cause, right. You know, because the, the, the uh, local prosecutors had it the day of the event. Uh, but fortunately, the person that took the uh, tape released it. Yeah. It's, then he released it thinking it would help mm-hmm. the guys, you know, the, the, the guys, uh, his friends cause. Well, I, I don't know. You know why I say I don't know? Because the guys were not being prosecuted anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, I know, yeah. and I've heard that same, you know, I've heard people say that he was trying right. to help them by releasing it. Right. But he, he gave it to the local police of day, day one, which might have been to help him. Right. But then he released it to the public, to, you know, to, or to somebody, I should say. So I don't know, you know, I mean, who knows why he released it? I don't know. But either way, I'm just glad it's out there. But go ahead. I should not have interrupted. No, you, you're fine. It's, the the thing that's really is bothersome is in the neighborhood that I live in. I go on this other across the street and go in another neighborhood. It's a mm-hmm. big neighborhood, big streets. Sure. And I jog, and there's a Confederate flag in one of the houses. Now I grew up in you know in outside of Nashville, Tennessee, where seeing the Confederate the Confederate flag there doesn't mean the same there, so to speak. So, you know, country music, I was like, so yeah. I, to me, it's not a big deal. Mm-hmm. But my wife keeps reminding me, like, you're in Virginia, you're not in Nashville, right? Right. Well, yeah. let me drop this on you so you'll know something, because I'm older than you. It does mean the same thing. Okay. I'm telling you why. If you study, you look at how many lynchings occurred <laughs> yeah. in, in Nashville, in Tennessee, in Kentucky, they're not substantially <laughs> right. lower than the lynchings. In Virginia and North Carolina. Yeah. You know, so I'm just saying that, you know, there, there are people that have a Confederate flag that don't necessarily um, show themselves to be racist outwardly. Right. I, I'm just going to drop it out there because I don't want nobody thinking that 
um, just because they live in a place where white folks say hi, uh, you know, uh, right. means that they don't have that same deep seated Southern concept of the value of the Confederacy. Yeah. And so when I was, you know, the place where I jog at has that. And, but I don't, I don't feel no type of way about it. Right. You know, I just mind my business and I jog. The thing that is really bothersome to me is now I am concerned about jogging in that same neighborhood because the thought would have never crossed my mind, Mm -hmm. never crossed my mind that me jogging, having on a workout outfit Mm -hmm. and jogging in the street with headphones on, somebody would view that as a threat or what are you doing here? You know, that's a generational thing. And I'm going to tell you why. Again, I'm older than you, so I can, I I can, you know, kind of, kind of speak to it as well. (laughs) I went, I was uh, in Florida in Miami on a business trip and I went jogging. Okay. I'm wearing short pants. It's hot in in Miami. I'm wearing short pants, a, a tank top. I got earphones and I'm jogging. I come back to my hotel. I get on the elevator. And one of the elevator employees says to me, you're not supposed to be here. You have to be a resident of this hotel to be in here. (laughs) Okay. So she immediately presses the next button and contacts security. She gets off and contacts security. Now she don't know what floor I'm on, you know, at the time. Right. I take that back. She knew what floor I was going to, but she didn't know what room I was in. When I'm leaving the hotel, that's when someone says to, you know, lets me know that, oh, we see that you are a resident here. Now, so I'm saying, believe you me, this is not a brand new thing. Right. And let's bring it up to Virginia. Okay. Um, I live in a neighborhood similar to your neighborhood. My wife and I were out um, um, walking through the neighborhood. It's been a few years back. A car pulls up beside us. And every word that you could think of that you could call a black man was being called. Wow. All right. So now what does that mean? Now, when I go jogging, see, I don't go jogging now without some type of protection. It's sad, but true. I don't walk with my wife through the neighborhood unless I'm carrying a gun. Wow. And it ain't just started because they killed him. Right, right. It's because, in you know, I live in a generation where, you know, our, our our thought process about how we could easily, you know, be accosted. And it's not the first time I've been accosted. I've been accosted by a policeman for jogging in my own neighborhood, you know. And so it's not the first time it's happened. You know, where are you going? Why are you running through this neighborhood, nigga? I say, because I live here. Wow. Where do you live at? I got to tell you where I live at. Right. I was in a car accident in my neighborhood. One, the, woman, the woman ran into the back of me and the police officer screaming and yelling at me, screaming and yelling at me. And then I just said to him, I want your supervisor. I stayed calm because I knew you got to stay calm. I said, I want to talk to your supervisor. I wrote my window. You know, so I'm, I'm, all I'm saying is that, right. you know what? Unfortunately, this is something that is not isolated. And if right. you're in a generation that I'm in, it ain't brand new to you. Right. You know, it's just your, 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 your sorrow is that is still going on. See, that's my deep sorrow that is still going on. I know my parents went through it. I know I went through it. I'm right. so sad that you have to go through it. Right. It's, but I keep going back to why. That's a good question. And you know what? I'm just smart enough to have the answer. <laughs> Our president is the key to how to understand racism. I must admit, before him, I did not understand it totally. As much as I have talked to white folk about racism, Mm -hmm. I've never understand it totally. Our president is telling everyone that the problem with the coronavirus is something that happened in China. In fact, He no longer calls it COVID-19. He doesn't call it the coronavirus. He calls it the Chinese virus. Right. That tells us why people are so racist. 
He does not want to own up to the fact that his problems stem from his own backyard. So in order to make himself feel better, he says that the problems are from China, that they are the ones. He was asked a question about COVID-19 yesterday at a news conference, and he said to this person who was who, the news person, why don't you ask the Chinese president? As if to say all of our problems stem from their inability to do what they should have done. Right. People who don't want to take accountability for where they are in life want to blame other people. We happen to be those ones that they fear the most, so they blame the most. We're not responsible for them not getting jobs, but they blame us. Mexicans are not responsible for them not getting jobs. Latinos, but they blame Latinos. Right. When I was in college, we had affirmative action and they blamed us for taking places in colleges that they should have had. They blamed us for taking jobs that they should have had, but they never said to themselves that they were taking seats that we should have had. Right. See, they didn't think about when they were taking seats on the bus that we should have had, that that was affirmative action in reverse. Right. They didn't see it that way. When you blame other people for your problems, that's really is a form, that, that's what develops racism. Because everything that's negative, you want to blame somebody else rather than taking on ownership. And that's, how I think, how people, how it becomes so deep-seated. I don't even think people really realize the white privilege that they have. No, they do not. And see, when they stop having that privilege, you got to blame somebody. And so they blame another race because they don't want to blame each other. Because if you blame each other, it's like blaming yourself. I, you know, with my staff, I have to, staff in one location is mostly white. And we go through things and, and I tell them it's, it's black owned company. But this is just not fair. You should do something about this. You should, you should, uh, contact Richmond and, and go up there. It's like, okay, but this is status quo. Now I can go do all of that mm-hmm. and then, you know, bust through the wall, you know, get scarred up. And then somewhere about six, seven months, maybe even two years from that point, I've, somebody's going to say, okay, now it's time to get this company. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not, we know sometimes it's just not worth it, you know, so you can win in the long haul and stay right. in business. Where with the, with the white privilege, you can go down to Richmond. You can mm-hmm. raise pure hell. Mm-hmm. You can go to the Capitol with a gun strapped to your shoulder and won't nobody say nothing to you. Absolutely. Again, if you look at, you compare what these people are doing now to what the Black Panthers did, and you look at the disparity in how they were treated. Mm -hmm. See, the whites will go to the Capitol with guns. I remember when President Obama was first elected and he did a town hall, and outside of the town hall, there were people lined up with guns, shotguns, rifles, and pistols. Do you really think that if Trump did a town hall, right. that they would let a bunch of black men stand outside with guns? Right. Even though legally you are supposed to be able to, there's no way Secret Service would do, let, allow that. When the Black Panthers stood outside with shotguns and rifles, they tried to arrest them. They, they, they said you were gathering illegally. You don't have a permit to march. Right. They gave all kinds of reasons why they couldn't do it. So there's great disparity. You know, when you look at, um, you know, the incident of the gentleman that was jogging, right, just from a legal aspect of it, they gave, they gave several reasons why that, you know, they were justified, right? You know, one reason they said was because it was a citizen's arrest, Right. Mm -hmm. Now, here's what we know. You know, I mean, black folk are not ignorant of the law. A citizen's arrest can only happen if you have an eyewitness account that there was a crime. Right. They had no eyewitness account that there was a crime. Now, their logic was that we saw him coming out of a house that was under construction. Just because I come out of a house under construction does not mean I was robbing the house. Right. In fact, he had nothing in his hand. Right. So therefore, you can't say he was stealing something. He went inside, he looked around and he left. Think about how many people, when they see a house under construction, will go inside and just look at it. Right. See how many rooms it is, you know, see what the layout is. You know, 
we do it all. My wife, you know, does it all the time. I shouldn't say we, she does it all the time because she just likes, you know, doing it. That's kind of like her hobby. Right. It's to just look at houses. So, but, but they said he was stealing when he had nothing in his hands. Right. He's jogging. So we know he was stealing anything, but they use that as their excuse for shooting him, you know, right. but even with a citizen's arrest, you can't kill somebody. Exactly. It, that's where, that's where my, if, it's one thing if the police had done it, but this, you're not police. No, you're, yeah. you're not police. Right. You know, and then you had, then you had to go drive over there to find him mm-hmm. to do this. Right. So you knew what you was going to do mm-hmm. and you let you, you build yourself up in your head to this is some, this is somebody committing a, a crime. When they did the when they did the research, they found out there was no rash of break ins. That there was um, one theft, and the theft came because the father had a vehicle, his vehicle broken into, and a gun was stolen. Mm. So, because he had someone steal something out of his vehicle, they presumed that it had to be a black man. See, that's the presumption, right? You know, when something is stolen, it's a black man. And that idea is perpetuated. Think about how many times we've had um, people commit crimes and then say it was a black person that did it Mm -hmm. when they themselves committed the crime. Right. You know, uh, one of the most infamous cases uh, was a woman that drove her children in her car, drove them into a lake and all of her children drowned. Now, what she said was that a black man abducted her children. Yeah. You know? I remember that. And and they yeah. spent days looking for a black man right. that stole some white children. You know, everybody in the black community knows. Right. right. There's not a black man around here that's trying to steal some white children. Right. You know, that ain't, as a matter of fact, you can't get the black man to steal his own children. Right. <laughs> Much less steal some black, you know, some white kids. There are not too many black men that I know of that if they have, if they're in dispute over custody, we'll just go steal their kids and run off somewhere. Right. That's just not how we operate. But they believed her for about two weeks till finally they start to do more research and they realized that this just didn't make sense. And eventually, and eventually she was arrested. The same thing happened in New York when uh, so, some, uh, someone was killed and thrown off of one of the bridges up there. And the guy said, it was a black guy. I saw him running away, so forth and so on. And they realized, no, it wasn't a, a black right. man. It was him that did it. Same thing with the, um, the, the, the gentleman, the, the young boys in New York City. When they were convinced that these four young boys raped, you know, that, that right. white female that was jogging. Now, and she herself, yeah, it was, you know, four black men. When she knew it was only one attacker. She knew it was only one attacker. And our president, our current president, took out a full page ad to try to help convict those four young, those young teenagers. You know, that's why I say, you know, he, he's racist himself. Uh, but, but, but why? When they, it came to light that it was not them. Even when they came to light that it was a Hispanic gentleman that did it, they still refused to accept it. When he confessed, when the DNA proved that it was him mm-hmm. and all this stuff, they didn't want to still, you know, act as if, well, they must have done something some other time. So we didn't coerce the, we didn't coerce their, their testimony. You know, when the boy eyes swollen shut, he accidentally fell down and that's why he testified and said he did it. You know, it's, it's crazy stuff. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like I've, we've, I've said before on a previous episode, when I like when I went to Dubai, that was probably the safest I have ever felt. Mm-hmm. And was and I had some some white business partners of mine ask me, "How was your time in Dubai?" And I looked them dead in the face. I said, "It was wonderful. It was like being white." Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they did not know. They were shocked that I said it, and they didn't even know what that meant. And mm-hmm. it's like because you don't know what that means, you will never understand, right? Like where I'm coming from with that statement. Absolutely. And for anyone that's listening that happens to not be black, it doesn't mean that we want to be white. <laughs> right. 
It simply means we wanted to we want to be treated equal right. as any other individual on this earth. Right. That's and it's it's it was freeing. Mm-hmm. You know, you like uh, I was driving one day, come, going back home, and this was a little baby walking across the street. Mom, parents, nowhere to be found, just mm-hmm. out in the middle of the street. So I pulled over, immediately got the car because it was a two way street. I didn't want somebody coming around, fooling around with their phone, and hit the child. So I mm-hmm. grabbed the child, trying to find out where you stay. I immediately called my wife because number one thing in my head was. Black man, random baby. Now it was a black baby, Mm -hmm. but it's like black man. I don't Mm -hmm. want to be like, I don't want anything to come out of this. Sure. I need to call her, come up here with me. So now I got somebody here Mm -hmm. because black man on the side of the road with a baby. It's like, okay, what's going on? Or the mama happens to come down. Then then she mad. Right. Like I don't want this drama. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like, but the fact that we even got to think like that, it's what's really is what's really wrong with America. You're absolutely right. It it is beyond conscionable that people who are supposed to be looking out for the good of the entire country will not recognize that and act on it. You know, they make so many excuses about it, as if to say we made it up in our minds that we got treated that way. It's it's just crazy. You know, I, I think that, you know, one of the things that we have to start doing is we have to become solution oriented. Yeah. You know, we, we have to stop. You know, we're always marching and then we let it go. We have to be, we have to hold people accountable. I mean, we have to really hold them accountable. So that means that if the district attorney does not prosecute, we had to, we got to vote them out the next round. We can't wait. As soon as they come up for election, we got to vote them out. We got to start campaigning against them as soon as they do what they have done and keep it on the forefront so we can get them out of office. They need to know we're not going to let you get elected again. Right. You know, if, if, if the judge renders, you know, um, a decision that s- shows their bias, then we got to we got to petition the, um, the delegates right away and say, get them out of office. We have to put the same kind of respect or fear in them that they have put in us, you know, uh, because see, if it's a black judge, they fear not doing the right thing Mm. because they know if they give a young black, young white kid life, you know, or uh, uh, a bag of cocaine, that they're going to get retaliated against. They know if a black man kills a white woman and that judge says, well, I don't think he needs to get any time, that judge is going to be out of office. Mm -hmm. But the white judges don't think that way. And that's why they do what they do. Yeah. And so we talked about solution oriented, which is, you know, one of the things you said was uh, voting. Mm-hmm. So you need to make sure that you not only get registered to vote, that you actually vote. And that's one of the things that's coming up here with COVID-19 is a 2020 election that is kind of murky. Like, how's that going to take place? I know for the current um, election that's taking place, I got the notification to do absentee balloting, but I didn't get the letter. But the letter literally on the website, it says you got to have it sent in by May 12th. Right. I don't have it yet. So I can't send it in. Right. So then, and I know from experience, if you try to go to the precinct to vote and you've already requested absentee ballot, you can't vote. No. So, I'm making sure I don't make that mistake in the 20 right. the general election, but it's, it's crazy how all this stuff is going is different now with the COVID-19 you know, uh, situation that's going on. How do you think things will play out for 2020? You know, I, I think unfortunately voting will be repressed because people will not necessarily, some of the, especially older people won't feel comfortable standing in line to vote. Um, but I, I cannot, believe we can accept four more years of Donald Trump in office. You know, I, I would rather vote for a dog to be in office than, than Donald Trump stay in office, you know, because what he has done to this country is unconscionable. You know, the, the idea of, of using division as a weapon to stay in office is unconscionable for a president to do that. 
and 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 I'm not trying to make a um, a statement about whether or not um, he is good, bad, or indifferent, <clears throat> because there are no totally good, there are no totally bad, right? But the methodology that he uses is what I find to be unconscionable. You know, as 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 the as the leader, your job is to try to unite and not to continue to divide. And he has no problem doing that. He has no problem because he knows who the majority of voters are. And so he uses that, you know, like a sword yeah. uh, to stay in office. And you know, another thing he uses too is um, what business person Damon John will say is dirty pom poms. Mm-hmm. Is he uses the media to get negative press, what still keeps him in the press. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, if CNN stop falling for the bait when he tweets something crazy, like don't report on it. That's what he wants you to do. He wants you to report on it so you can keep him in the news, which keeps his base. You're feeding the base by saying, look at them attacking Trump all, you know, mm-hmm. over this and blah, 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 blah. Like you keeping them at a frenzy. Some stuff you don't need to report on. Right. Mm-hmm. Like I remember Remember when they when he first got in office and they was talking about how many Diet Cokes he was drinking? It's like, who cares? <laughs> well, you know, it, it is crazy. But, you know, as you say, you know, if, you know, if you look at it, I think NWA uh, said it best um, when they were being attacked um, by, the, by the media. And um, their comment was that there is no such thing as bad press. Right. You know, that all news is good news. And so one of the guys commented, and I can't think of his name right now, but he was the leader of the group. And he said that he's, he's glad that people are smashing and burning his records. It was Dr. Dre. Uh, not Dr. Dre. Um, From Ice Cube? No, 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 no. They, he, they weren't, he, that wasn't the leader of the group. Uh, and I think they wanted, he, he died of AIDS. I can't think of his name. Oh, Easy e Easy e right. Easy e said that because if you burn them, you had to pay for them first. <laughs> <laughs> So at least, right, you pay for my stuff right. and I'm happy about it. And, and I, you know, and so, but you're right. That, and that's what Donald Trump does is that if he, if he is, if he is the only thing that's on the news, then that means that his opponents are not on the news. Exactly. And so all you hear about is him and, and, but, but he has the ability to make bad news benefit him, not just because his opponent is not on the news, but because when he tell his supporters, see how they are doing me, see how he, he vilifies the, the news, see how they are attacking me. It, 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 it emboldens his followers because in their minds, everyone's against our man. And right. so we had to make sure that we protect him. And that's what they do. So even though they will see what he's saying is a lie, they still feel compelled to protect him. And, and that, um, just exacerbates the situation. And that's why I say, when you look at that young man that was shot, and you think about the uh, state of the nation, I blame the leader. And I know there are people that will disagree and say, well, how can you blame him for what someone else did? Because he has emboldened people to do what they do. He has emboldened people to fly the rebel flag. He has emboldened people to feel like they are empowered in their racist rhetoric, you know, and, and in their ability to, to come forward now and speak their minds and tell other people we have no right to be in this country to get out. You know, how can you tell people that because they don't agree with you that they should leave the country right. as if your forefathers were the original people in the country? They tend to forget they weren't here. They weren't here originally either. So what, rather than telling other people to go back, why don't they go where they came from? If they think being the Aryan nation is so great. Why don't they go to Germany and live with them right. and stay there, right. you know, and, and, and let us stay in the melting pot where, where we do have, you know, uh, variety. Yeah. Have you seen that photo of the guy that was in a supermarket with a uh, KKK hat on? Mm-hmm. And, it's, and it's, I'm sitting there like, you want attention so bad. You know, thank you for letting me know that you are, you know, a bona fide, signed, sealed, delivered racist. Right. But the thing that's the thing that gets me, right? This is what bothers me by my own people. Mm-hmm. Is that if if somebody was to walk in the hood with a different color on, he'd be dealt with. 
Mm-hmm. But somebody like that can walk into a supermarket with Ku Klux Klan hat on. Now, and nothing happens to him. Right. And that's part, in my opinion, of the problem. I, 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 I amen you. I, I second <laughs> that motion. And I'm voting for you <laughs> to be in charge of black people. <laughs> right. that, that's the problem. You know, and... We're, you know, we're coming to the end, you know, right now. We've had a really good discussion. I know we're going to get a lot of comments and, and questions and things on this. And if you are watching this, um, we are now premiering our episodes now on Facebook as well as on YouTube. I want everybody to subscribe, comment, like. I want us to get this this good content out there for the public to see. And so they can comment, share, and change the way we think as society and make every day strong. Before we close out, you got anything else? Uh, just, uh, I, I just echo your sentiment. You know, there is time for us to not just march, but there is time for us to demand with our actions that we will no longer be second class citizens in the country of our birth. Yeah. Thank you all so much for joining us. This is your host, C.B. Baker. The next time. Peace.